people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to an episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Erado, and with me, as always, is a guy who would never start wildfires in Canada, Mike <laughs> Van de Bogart. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you once again to our loyal listeners for tuning in. Just a couple of quick announcements here. So first, we'll get to our Patreon shout-outs. We got Noah uh, Scheistel, <laughs> probably totally butchered that, Travis Fritch. Don't call Noah that. <laughs> Nicole Orman, <laughs> Day Sparing, Jill Lorenz, and Corey uh, Biru. And a special shout out to a continued Patreon supporter, Rachel DeGarmo. She uh, upgraded her uh, subscription a few episodes ago, and we forgot to co- mention it. So Ooh. she left a voicemail for us. Oh, I don't have any cheering buttons. <laughs> I got to put a cheer button on the, the board you so do. we can cheer for Patreon. Or, patrons. Claps or yeah, something. something like that. I have this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. It's hilarious. We have a live studio audience tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this episode actually has been recommended by a few people. I have two of the people um, that recommended it that I could remember. Um, I apologize if others recommended this, but thank you to uh, Julie Bailey, who is an actual Patreon supporter, and then Courtney Grimes for recommending this. Thank you very much. And if you would like to call into the show, we uh, probably aren't going to do it this episode. One of these episodes, we're going to open the lineup uh, during the show and try to answer some calls live maybe at the end, but... Um, we're a lot of technical stuff we're working through right now. So yeah, we're just I'm I'm praying that the thing I just did for the video works because the video quality will be, will be exceptional. Yeah, if we, but uh, uh, it's always a risk and a new thing. We got we did some upgrades while Joe was having fun in the Tetons. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got some upgrades to the studio. We've got how many camera feeds running now? One, five? two, three, four, five. Yeah, five. five. At least five. <laughs> yeah, so probably overkill now. <laughs> Um, but if you want to call the show and leave a voicemail about anything, you can call 208-391-6913. Just remember, anything you say, uh, the funnier or uh, more outrageous it is, it will probably get aired on a future episode. Absolutely. And finally, uh, if you want to help support the show, you can uh, subscribe to Patreon, where there's additional episodes that are only available on Patreon or YouTube memberships. Or premium subscriptions on Apple and coming soon, uh, subscriptions on Twitter. Oh, so, that's exciting. And we have stores on uh, Facebook and our website. So you All can the buy things. Some, of our sw- some of our swag. So, And our address is on <laughs> our website if you want to just send us envelopes of money. All right. Are you good? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. April 30th, 2023, an experienced hiker set out on a multi-day solo hike in Joshua Tree National Park in California. He had prepared for the hike and was familiar with the area. When he failed to show up on time at his pickup location, park officials were alerted and the search began. Join us this week as we investigate the case of Tremel Evans. So, how many episodes have we done in Joshua Tree? Uh, two. I, we've done um, Paul Miller, Paul Miller, and Erica Lloyd. Erica Lloyd. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, Paul Paul Miller was the the one that that was like our was second episode. To, yeah, that was like second number two, and we had that great interview with George Land. He was the PIO over there, so that was fantastic. Um, but I wanted to know how Erica many times Lloyd we talked was. About this. Um, I think we covered her during the early part of COVID. That sounds familiar. Um, yes, because she went on her trip because of COVID. Yeah, her her salon was shut down. Yes, and, um, she was like going to clear her head. So check out those episodes too if you love Joshua Tree National Park or you want to be scared to hike in Joshua Tree National <laughs> yeah. Park. Uh, so Joshua Tree is one thousand two hundred forty two square miles. So it's fifteenth in size, based uh, slightly larger than the than the state of Rhode Island. Actually, I think lots of things are larger than Rhode Island. <laughs> yeah, Rhode Island's a pretty small state. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so where this takes place is the Black Rock Campground. Uh, This large 99-site campground is located in the northwest corner of the park. Uh, Each campsite has a picnic table and a fire ring with restrooms and water nearby. Uh, Shopping facilities are only five miles away in the town of of Yucca Valley. Uh, Campsites do vary in size and can accommodate both tents and RVs. Uh, Day-use picnic area and a dump station are also available for Horse owners, a separate area is provided for camping and staging a ride. So it's like a decent size national park campground that you'd see. Yeah, it's a pretty good size one. I mean, it's probably a lot of times when we go hiking, we would our first night, like when we're tired from driving, would be a campsite like this where you could just pull your car up. It's what we call glamping because there's a bathroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a fire ring, a table, and a bathroom. That's yeah. glamping in our book. Yes. Uh, so as we said, it's in California. Uh, The National Park was established in 1994, so one of the more recent parks. Yes. It does see about 2.3 million visitors per year. That's of 2020. So there's quite a few people that go to Joshua Tree. Yep. Uh, Humans have occupied the area, however, uh, for at least 5,000 years. I don't think that many people were going back then. (laughs) The first group known to inhabit the area was the Pinto culture, followed by American Indians, including the Serrano, the Chemueve, and the Chaula. I'm sure Kahula. I got those. Ones. Kahula. Kahula. Maybe. I probably said it wrong too. Now, uh, well, between two of us, we both got it wrong. There we go. Not even close. In the 1800s, cattlemen drove their cows into the area for the ample grass available at the time and built water impoundments for them. Miners dug tunnels through the earth looking for gold and made tracks across the desert with their trucks. Homesteaders began filling claims in the 1900s. They built cabins, dug wells, and planted crops. I always wondered, I've never looked into this. When they did gold mining, yeah, did they just randomly start digging in areas? Was there a method? Did they use like those uh, the two sticks like they do to find water? I don't know <laughs> or how, something like, like who the first guy was, but I I imagine like word spread like hey, uh, they're finding gold. Like and, a dude found gold in an area, and then everyone I think starts, that's all it took. Is wherever like, they're standing, just start digging down. One guy must. <laughs> one guy found gold, and then. The word started spreading and people would just flock there hoping to find more. <laughs> How many times do you think people lied? <laughs> Probably and caused lied. like think about back then. This is a funny this is a funny thought, and I promise I'll move on. Back then, if you lied about finding gold, yeah. you could get a family to move across the country. Yeah. So people could be living where they are living right now because someone lied to somebody. I mean, if I was a gold <laughs> miner back then, I would probably give a false location. Like, oh, 100%. From where I actually found yeah, it. Yeah, like I found gold over there. Yeah. And then everyone goes over there and you're like, oh, by the way, I'll buy all this land for no reason. I yeah. want to raise cattle or something. <laughs> yeah. But like in t- like once you move, you move. Like now you'd search me like, oh, that guy's a liar. There's no gold there. Yeah, it's not move. like today, like you rent a U-Haul, you spend like two days driving or, across or, the country. You or s- it's like or you don't Oregon do any trail. of that <laughs> and you call someone and say, hey, is there gold there? And they're like, yeah. no. And you're like, oh, good thing I didn't move my whole family across back, the country. No, well, I mean, back then it was like the video game Oregon Trail, like... Yeah, I like mean, a bunch of you died along you might the way. Not make it all yeah, the way. And the guy's like, just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> it took three months. All right. Anyway, by the late 1920s, the development of new roads into the desert had brought an influx of land developers and cactus poachers. I bet those are hard to poach. Yeah, they're always running away. <laughs> Minerva Hoyt, a Pasadena resident who was extremely fond of the desert plants, became concerned about the removal of the cacti and other plants to the gardens of Los Angeles. Her tireless efforts to protect this area culminated in 825,000 acres being set aside as Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, National Monument. National Monument in 1936. Yes. It went to the next page. (laughs) The monument was administered by the superintendent of Yosemite National Park until James Cole was appointed as the first superintendent in 1940. 
The eastern portion of the historic oasis of Mara was deeded to the National Park Service by the 29 Palms Corporation in 1950. That same year, the monument's size was reduced by 265,000 acres to exclude some mining property. Oh, like there's already mines there, maybe? Or, yeah. Okay. Fine. Whatever. <laughs> in 1976, Congress designated 420,000 acres within the monument as wilderness. Of the park's current 792,623 acres, 591,000 is designated as wilderness. As part of the Desert Protection Bill, Joshua Tree National Monument was elevated to park status on October 31st, 1994. The bill also added another quarter of a million acres. The new park boundary follows natural features and includes complete ecological units such as entire mountain ranges. Uh, Previous boundaries divided these ranges along survey lines. The additions provide better resource protection with easier boundary identification and monitoring and important habitat for desert bighorn sheep. That's cool. I didn't know how they like picked yeah. boundaries before. Yeah, I didn't either. Like, I, just because I never thought of it. And I forgot to do interesting facts this time. Oh, that's okay. Uh, according to our friends at the Copen Climate Classification System, Joshua Tree National Park has a hot desert climate. Uh, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, the plant hardiness zone at the Cottonwood Visitor Center at 3,081 feet. Elevation is 8B. I don't know what that means. With an average annual extreme minimum temperature of 19.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures are most comfortable in the spring and fall with an average high of 85 and uh, low of 50, respectively. Winter brings cooler days around 60 degrees Fahrenheit and freezing nights. Snows occur occasionally at higher elevations. Summers are hot uh, over 100 degrees during the day and not uh, cooling much below 75 until early hours of the morning. It gets hot. Yeah, it's, it's a desert, all right. <laughs> uh, the terrain. So straddling the San Bernardino and Riverside counties, the park includes parts of two deserts, each an ecosystem whose characteristics are determined primarily by elevation, the higher Mojave Desert and the lower Colorado Desert. The little San Bernardino Mountains traverse the southwest edge of the park. So the higher and cooler Mojave Desert is a special habitat of Yucca brev- brevifolia. I'm sure brevifolia. <laughs> the Joshua tree for which the park is named. That's an easier name to say, just Joshua tree. Yeah. It occurs in patterns from to form from dense forest to distantly spaced specimens. In addition to Joshua tree forests, the western part of the park includes some of the most interesting geologic displays found in the California's deserts. The dominant, dominant geological feature of this landscape are hills of bare rock, usually broken up into loose boulders. These hills are popular among rock climbers and scrambling enthusiasts. The flat land between these hills is sparsely forested with Joshua trees. Together with the boulder piles and skull rock, the trees make the landscape otherworldly. This is a park I've been wanting to go hike in for probably almost a decade well now that we're doing collaborations with april her and her husband live out there we're all gonna go do like a show there so that's uh gotta we gotta get that in the books yes and for those who don't know we're talking about look up april bay she's doing a lot of true crime and we did an episode with her she's releasing by the time this comes out this week so it's gonna be when will this release do you think tomorrow oh okay so (laughs) next week yeah (laughs) all right Uh, Some of the dangers present in Joshua trees. So some of the animals, uh, reptiles, there are 46 different species, including 26 different types of snakes. And we're not going to tell you what to do if you get bit by one too bad. (laughs) That caused a lot of chaos. Yeah. yeah, Well, just uh, we'll, we'll tell you about the snakes and yes. um, we're not experts in treating snake bites. So yeah, you can, we're not even, well, we looked up how, but apparently I other, know, I know what I would do, but we're not going to, yeah. we're not going to go into it. <laughs> I, would, I know what I would do also. <laughs> uh, Western diamondback rattlesnake. Although the venom is somewhat less toxic than some other rattlesnakes, it makes up for it by producing immense quantities. As much as 800 milligrams can be delivered in a full envenomation, which thankfully are rare. The venom causes severe muscle deterioration as well as massive internal bleeding. That sounds fantastic. (laughs) Regarded as the most aggressive of rattlers, it can grow up to 7 feet and 15 pounds, but typically specimens are in the 4 to 5 foot range and less than 10. 
Uh, now we have the northern Mojave rattlesnake. The Mojave rattler has the most toxic venom of North American snakes and a reputation is extremely aggressive towards humans. Still want to go to the park, Mike? I do. <laughs> Physically similar to the Western Diamondback, the Mojave Rattler typically shades towards greens, sparking the common name Mojave Greens. Oh, so it goes like where people would probably end up going. Yes. The green stuff. Limited to the southern areas of Arizona, California, Utah, New Mexico, and parts of Texas, the Mojave Rattlesnake prefers open areas of sparse vegetation and sandy desert conditions. It will use a sidewinding locomotion when appropriate, but most typically does not. Comprised of a combination neurotoxin along with more common hemophagic, fag, fag, I don't know how to say that word, hemogaphic <laughs> elements, I'm going to, whatever. The Mojave rattlesnake venom is considered more toxic than even Australia's famed tiger snake. Because bites often bleed less and cause less initial distress, it isn't uncommon for people that have been bitten to underestimate the peril. The combination neurotoxins can cause massive negative effects that only become obvious as long as 24 hours after envenomation. The most common anti-venom in the U.S. is based in large part on the venom of the Mojave rattlesnake and is highly effective when administered promptly. So that's what you do after you get by, bit by a snake. Go you to get the, the anti-venom. Yes. From a professional. <laughs> yes. That's, that's our advice. Uh, there are 250 bird species of birds. Um, individually, I'm sure they're okay, but if they all attack you at once, probably very dangerous. Uh, 57 species of mammals, including bobcats, California mountain lions, gray fox, California black bear. This is, per the NPS, not very common. The black bear there. So if you yell at us, you are wrong. <laughs> Southern mule deer and desert bighorn sheep. More than 75 species of invertebrates, including the giant hairy scorpion, tarantulas, and the painted lady butterfly. They're very, you know, very uh, terrible to humans, the butterfly. Yes. I was trying to come up with a joke there, but... Uh, oh, yeah, you have fell. You're an accountant. Yeah. You're an accountant. Just, uh, just count <laughs> just things. Count things. <laughs> Heat and sun. <laughs> During the summer, expect high temperatures because you're in a desert. It's an intense sunlight. Low humidity because you're in a desert. Drink plenty of water because you're in a desert and you'll get dehydrated. Um, uh, drink at least one gallon of water per day to replace loss from sweat. So you got to have at least four liters of water on you if you're going to be out there all day. You were saying that kind of, it reminded me of that uh, joke that um, Norm McDonald said about the bear. Like, eh, I need this guy. Uh. He, you said it once <laughs> during a show. Like, really, I wish I remembered the joke. Oh, I'm kind of remembering it's what like, you're saying, but it's like, okay, yeah, he was, uh, he was eaten by a bear. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe will look that up when I'm talking. Yes, I will. <laughs> um, bring the water. You will need the park with you. Potable water is not available at uh, is only available at a few locations near the edges of the park. That is the visitor center, Joshua Tree at the Twenty Nine Palms. Park Headquarters, the Western Entrance Station, Black Rock Campground, Cottonwood Campground, and Indian Cove Ranger Station. Otherwise, you need to bring your own. Yes. Don't forget to eat. You need to take in calories to fuel your outdoor activities on a hot day. Eating salty snacks can help your body replace electrolytes that are lost through sweating, but it will also probably mean you need a little more water. Yes. For sun protection, wear loose-fitted, light-colored cl clothing and wide-brimmed hat. Apply sunscreen to all exposed skin. Protect your eyes by wearing sunglasses. This is not the time to wear shorts and sandals. You want boots and pants that breathe. Just watch an old Western and you see what those guys are wearing. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you see people in the desert, look in the Middle East, anywhere, they're completely covered in clothing, and you wonder why, because yeah. they know what they're doing. Yes. Heat exhaustion. Look out for that. The result of dehydration due to intense sweating, hikers can lose one to two quarts of water per hour. Uh, symptoms, pale face, nausea, vomiting, which makes you lose more water, cool and moist skin, headaches, and cramps. Uh, you can also have heat stroke. This is a life-threatening emergency where the body's heat regulating mechanisms become overwhelmed by a combination of internal heat production and environmental demands. Your body loses its ability to cool itself. Uh, symptoms, flushed face, dry skin, weak and rapid pulse, high core body temperature, confusion, poor judgment, or an inability to cope, unconsciousness, or seizures. For treatment of heat stroke, victims must be cooled immediately. Continuously pour water on the victim's head and torso, fan to create an evaporating, um, evaporative cooling effect, immerse the victim in cold water if possible, move the victim to shade, and remove excess clothing, the victim needs evacuation to a hospital. Someone should go for help while attempts to cool the victim continue. 
Call 911 if yeah, you can. Yeah, it's a serious condition, especially in a desert. Um, if any of those symptoms start happening with yourself or anyone you're hiking with, yeah, uh, take it seriously. No bueno. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> hyponatremia or water intoxication, an illness that mimics the er e early symptoms of heat exhaustion. It is a result of low sodium in the blood caused by drinking too much water and losing too much salt through sweating. Symptoms include nausea, vomiting, altered mental states, uh, states, confusion, frequent urination. The victim may appear intoxicated. In extreme cases, se seizures may occur. Treatment, have the victim eat salty foods, solely drink sports drinks with electrolytes, and rest in the shade. If mental alertness decreases, seek immediately hel immediate help. So just get like smart water and stuff. Yeah. Stuff that has electrolytes. That's they, um, good. Whenever I've gone hiking, I've, I bring a lot of those little packets of uh, like Gatorade. Oh, yeah. And you can just mix it right into or your... Or runners have those, like the gel. Yeah. They, like, put the gel in their mouth and stuff. So you want something that's light, but something that you yes. can mix with your water. Yeah, that's how that... What, uh, the wee for a wee girl who died. Or, like you drink too yeah. much water and she died because she had water intoxication. Yep. Uh, you also want to look out for storms and flash floods. They can be powerful and sudden. Uh, and they can be nowhere near where you are. So you want to avoid canyons and washes during rainstorms. Be prepared to move to higher ground. Yeah, didn't the PIO tell us, and I have I think I've heard this before, that um, it can rain up to like 20, 30 miles away. And if you're downstream from that yeah. storm, it, it, you can still get flash floods. Oh, absolutely. In the area we were hiking. So we heard that in uh, when we went hiking Zion. in Zion. Yeah. yeah, so you just want to be in any... Whenever I've hiked in desert uh, areas, I've always... Kept a you know an eye on the the weather forecasts. Kept an eye on the prize. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, hiking and climbing. Planning to hike, climb, or cycle in hot weather. Plan to bring along two gallons of water per person per day. Drink the water and do not economize. When the water is half gone, it's time to turn back. So you want to avoid hiking alone. Whether or not you're with a group, always inform a friend and family member of your planned route and expected return time. Carry a map and compass to be sure and be sure how to use them. Uh, Carry a comprehensive first aid kit. Add a comb and tape to your kit. These items are often helpful in removing uh, kala and other cacti spines from the skin. Other suggested items for desert hikers include tweezers, safety pins, bandages of various size, antibiotic ointments, antiseptic towelettes, wound closer strips. Those are really cool. Yeah. Mole skin or duct tape for blisters, compression bandages, ibuprofen, aspirin, antihistamine tablets, extra food and salty, salty snacks, an emergency blanket because it does get cold at night. This is not a comprehensive list, but will help get you started in your plan. Can't recommend moleskin enough. That, moleskin is the best. I mean, especially in a desert environment where it's kind of sandy, you're going to get blisters 100% guaranteed. Yeah. And uh, having the moleskin really helps. I mean, it's not going to get rid of the pain, but... Um, it doesn't make it worse. Doesn't make it worse. Because it can get worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, know your skill level and do not take chances. The desert can be deadly if we haven't drilled that in. Yes. Um, oh, and other things. Mine shafts. Many old mine sites are found within the park from when all those people lied. If you choose to visit them, use extreme caution and never enter mine tunnels or shafts. You can look up online. I don't even want to talk about it, but one of the worst deaths that ever occurred happened to somebody who was doing that. Oh, yeah. Winter. Winter temperatures can drop well below freezing. Hypothermia can be a hazard, even at temperatures above freezing. Always carry extra layers of clothing during cooler months. Uh, the short days of winter led some hikers to uh, miscalculate how much time they need to complete a hike around the winter solstice. Plan to be back to the at the trailhead by 4 p.m. All, All right. right. Let's go into Tremel Evans. Tremel. His family called him Tram, so I will just uh, I'll shorten it up. Uh, so uh, the... The subject's name is uh, Tram Evans. He went missing. A uh, very recent case. We don't typically cover cases this recent. Um, a lot of times because things change quickly. And um, But this, this case has drawn a lot of attention. Um, like we said, a lot of people are recommending this case. Uh, so he went missing on April 30th of 2023. He was a male, age 25. He was uh, six foot three, 190 pounds. He had brown, brownish red hair. Uh, his eyes were brown. He had facial hair with mustache. Those of you watching the video, of this Joe is um, showing a lot of pictures of. Yeah, I'm just uh, panning through pictures of him of Tram. Yeah, I mean, he seems like pretty cool dude. Uh, yeah, I looked at these photos like I want to hang out with that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the gear he was last seen in was a silver, white, gray sun hoodie, black Patagonia puffy vest. Blue shorts, blue shoes, 
Uh, they're Asics size 13, black REI backpack, egg crate style sleeping pad, dark green beanie, green Patagonia fanny pack. Um, based on reports from law enforcement family, he was well prepared for this hike. Um, he had the following items. Um, and I'm actually going to get into something here re- regarding the water, but he had two gallons of water on him. Um, and I've hiked, Joe and I have hiked Zion. I hiked Canyonlands, which um, is probably even more brutal than Joshua Tree in far, as far as remoteness. And um, based on kind of the calculation, I, he was going to be out there for five to six days. And like we said, there's no water in the park. There would have been water at the campground he started at. But um, obviously one liter equals about 0.26 gallons of water. And this is kind of a r- some rough math of how much water for a five to six trip you should take with you. So assuming the temperatures, I think I read his, the temperatures were in the 70s and 80s at the time he was hiking. So right, not too wild. Not too wild, but it's very dry, yeah. desert, sunny, desert environment. Yeah, that's a big point too. Like heat doesn't always mean water loss, the dryness too. Yeah. So he would potentially, based on his exertion level, so his, we'll get into it in the timeline, but he was planning to do about a 30 mile hike. Um, so he would need roughly about a half a liter of water per hour, which is about 0.13 gallons. And if you put this in like, it's hard to kind of get a perspective of that. That's about three 12 ounce cups of water per hour. If you're really exerting yourself or about six liters of water per day. So for his entire hike, he could have needed upwards of 30 liters of water, which would have weighed 66 pounds. So, Jeez. I mean, that's a lot of water, but that's something you got to factor That's a in. lot of day hiking if you're without gonna, coming back for water. Yeah, if you're going to do a long, multi-day backcountry hike in a desert, you're going to have to, you're going to be, you know, most of your packs going to be water, yes. <laughs> unfortunately. So um, he did have uh, four days worth of provisions which I did make a note, he planned to be out there five to six days, so he didn't technically bring enough food for the, even the planned hike. Um, so I typically try to bring enough for the hike and then maybe a little extra in case something happens. But what a boss. Look at that photo. <laughs> yeah. I love that picture. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, he did have a detailed trail map of the park. Like I said, the weather was pretty, pretty great for that time of year. Highs were in the mid-70s during the day and the mid-40s at night. Um, so like I said, he was pretty prepared for the hike. Um, personality wise, uh, his family described him as a very adventurous spirit who had a deep love for nature and exploration and a very experienced long distance hiker. He, um, some of the, he hiked, uh, the Appalachian trail. So all 2,200 miles of it, he summited Mount Whitney, which is the tallest mountain in the lower 48. And he, his family said he completed hundreds of overnight backpack excursions around the West Coast, Mountain West, New and New England area, and including doing this exact route in Joshua Tree multiple times in the okay. past. So he he knows he knows the he's area. an expert. He know he's been hiking yep. a ton. Um, so and you know he was prepared. He had he told his family where he was going. He um, he had gear with him. He had you know so. Um, let's see here. Oh, and according to his family, um, he would not have panicked if he found himself off trail. He would have used the trail map and his knowledge of the park to navigate back to the trail or to one of the roads through the park. So, um, that's kind of a brief description of tram. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. He's not like one of those like city hikers that came out to the park for the day in sandals. (laughs) Yes. So I mean, comparatively speaking, were those hikers compared to him? Yeah, I mean, yeah <laughs> with, with how often we're able to get out, so he's, he he's experienced. Yeah, I mean, he you do he, the eighteen, or you know what's up. Yeah, and he didn't really have a, a location like where he lived. He's he kind of it was like living around the Los Angeles area at the time, right. but nomadic. Very, yeah, nomadic. His family described him as a kind of a nomadic, and I mean, you look at these pictures. He does kind of. He's got that vibe. Oh, yeah. Nomad vibe. Yeah, very carefree, like, sure, I'll go live here. Yeah. Just because I decided right now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, all right, we'll jump right into timeline here. So, <laughs> 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 that's a great picture. Um, 
So Sunday, April 30th, 2023, around 8 p.m., Evans was dropped off at the Black Rock, uh, Black Rock uh, campground by a friend, and that friend confirmed he entered the park. Uh, no one else reported seeing him enter the park. Um, Evans planned to hike from Black Rock to Geology Tour Road and then back to Black Rock via the California Riding and Hiking Trail. Uh, according to park officials, this is a more than 30-mile round trip. So, you know, if he's planning to do this in five to six days, that's not, you know. Here's a picture of the Black Rock campground. Yeah. There's your fire pit table, and that's it. Yeah. Glamp- I mean, glamp- that look, glamping. That looks, I mean, super cool. Yeah, it's super cool. I would totally go there. But, uh, yeah, doing 30 miles in for someone as experienced as him and an accomplished long-distance hiker, that. So 30 miles, he's doing five days? Yeah. So he's being smart about it because we could do 30 miles in. Two days. We could do 30 miles in one day if it's not crazy mountainous. I'm not saying here. I'm saying in like a general hiking loop. Yeah. Like we would do 10 to 15 a day typically in the mountains. Yeah. So and 30 I mean, 30 and five, that's here, you know, taking if, it easy. It, I mean, if you're going to go out there prepared water wise, you're going to have a lot of weight on your back. So, yeah. You know, probably not as realistic to be able to cover that much ground. Uh, you're talking about a guy who did the AT. Yeah. Just saying. Just saying. So, uh, it is now Friday, May 5th, 2023, around 11 a.m. Uh, this was when Evans was supposed to be picked up by a friend. So when he didn't show up, they waited a couple hours, but by 1 p.m., um, they got concerned that he wasn't there, and he report they reported Evans overdue to park rangers, and Josar, the Josar team members quickly kicked off a search. So... Um, now we are going to move to May 8th of 2023. So the search is in full gear right now. And this is a statement from the national park service. So, and I'm going to quote Evans did not register for a backcountry use permit. Rangers have contacted all 55 people that had backcountry permits in that location, but none of them reported seeing him. His last known place of residence was Los Angeles, California, but he moves frequently. The search for Tramel Evans is ongoing. The Josar team is comprised of highly trained trackers, searchers, and climbers who are all familiar with the high desert. In addition to Josar, Joshua Tree is currently working with the Bureau of Land Management and California Highway Patrol helicopter. Please do not self-dispatch to search for Tramel Evans on your own and do not dispatch a drone to aid in the search efforts. The patrol helicopter cannot fly while drones are in the air and any unplanned drones in the air may seriously impede aerial search efforts. At, um, oh, this is interesting. At one point during the search, family actually reported that searchers may have possibly found footprints matching Tram's uh, shoe and size, suggesting that he may have hiked further into the park. But I was not able to find confirmation of that from an official source. So... I actually found a Facebook page started by, I believe, Tram's brother, where a lot of uh, this information comes from. So I will, I'll make a comment when the source is from family instead of law enforcement. So this footprint um, information came from family. So I, like I said, I can't verify that it was uh, officially confirmed by the National Park Service. So uh, the search... It continued for several weeks. I found an article from May 10th of 2023 from the San Francisco SF gate that just mentioned the search was still ongoing. They didn't really have any additional information. Um, on May 13th of 2023, the uh, Evans mother confirmed the search was still ongoing during an interview with Z107.7. Uh, the mother and brother of Tram said that the 25 year old may be passing through or camping in and around communities surrounding Joshua tree national park. So this was the first time during the search that we heard from family and they believed that he may not even be in the park anymore. So, Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's an interesting, um, theory coming from the family. So, and they told Z107.7 that Evans, like I said, is experienced just dist- a long distance hiker who is known to go off the grid, shutting down his phone and relying on cash. They mentioned in an interview interview that they're hopeful 
Evans has hiked out of the park and may be camping in and around um, Yucca Valley, Joshua Tree, or 29 Palms. They also asked residents of the local towns who live near Black Rock Campground, specifically on Covington Flat Road and La Con- Contentia <laughs> Road and Black Rock Canyon Road to check any security camera footage that may that they may have from May 1st to May 3rd. So the searchers weren't expanding outside the park, but the family was really starting to try to get the word out in the nearby towns to see if they... And like these so pictures, this, this is like as a as a crow flies to like where he started to where he went. Yeah, and you know the pictures of Tram. If I lived in Twenty Nine Palms or and I had seen that guy, I probably would remember it. Yeah, the handlebar mustache is unforgettable. Yeah. He's got a pretty <laughs> unique look. So, um, I think I would personally re- remember seeing him if if that was you know my town. Plus, you know he's not quiet wherever he goes. He's got a big personality. Yeah. Yeah, basically, I'm not saying in a bad way. I'm saying no. he probably talks to people like very boisterous. And you know, if he uh, if he's hiked this area multiple times in the past, he's probably he probably has been in these towns before. He may even know people from those towns. Yeah, you know, he might have befriended a bartender or sure. Um, so, um, so now we are going to move to May 30th of 2023. So we got an update from the family on the search. This was from Charlie Evans, Tram's brother. Um, and I also found, um, reports that the search had really been scaled down at this point. So according to news channel three, park rangers announced on Tuesday, May 30th, that the search is now, it, uh, now at a limited and continuous phase, they will still be doing daily searches. Uh, the national parks comprehensive search found no evidence that tram is still in the park. Uh, the park was like we said, yeah, they were notified of his absence at 1 p.m. So it, it's actually, the search was kicked off very quickly. Um, yeah, from, soon, from the point where he was supposed to arrive. Yeah, okay. which is, uh, we've in other episodes, we've covered cases where sometimes it's weeks yes. before the search starts. Oh, absolutely. That's way and better than what's normal. what they had going for him in this case is they knew his route. They literally yes. knew... Where he was going and where he would be, where they knew where he got dropped off. They knew his route, and they knew where he was going to be picked up. Yeah. So I mean, that is all information that we don't always have in cases. So um, that's what makes it a little more puzzling that nothing was found because they knew where to search. So, but one thing that's we, provided he stayed on his route. That's provided he stayed on his route, and um, a lot of times in cases, people in the park will see the subject at least once or twice. We'll get a confirmation. Sorry if anyone hears that dinging. They can't. You gotta. You gotta just got to roll through well, it. They can't. Well, now I got to tell them it's a drawbridge. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I was saying, a, a lot of times people will see the subject in the park and that'll give us a clue of how far they made it along their, their itinerary. In this case, we don't have that, which is a little odd. Um, Joshua Tree is a pretty popular park. And there were 55 other permit holders in that area while he was there. So um, a little odd. That leads a little bit more to the theory that he didn't stay in the park. But we'll get the theories in a bit. So this is an update coming from Charlie on May 30th of 2023. So really, what, only 15 days ago? Yes. Uh, pretty, pretty recent by uh, our standards. So Charlie said... Four helicopter missions totaling 25 hours of flight time. Their rescue helicopters equipped with heat-sensitive cameras, and their flight plans included the entire route that Tram planned to hike and the -the off-the-trail areas adjacent. Four Marine Corps uh, Corps drones, drone teams equipped with military-grade hardware. At the peak of their SAR response, 40 tracking and search personnel were on the ground focused on his planned route and offshoot trails as well as the off-trail areas adjacent. Four to six cadaver dog search teams focused on the areas around Tram's planned route. Continuous monitoring of his cell phone usage and location occurred, and continuous monitoring of his bank accounts occurred. Um, And this is some additional information provided by the family. Although the monitoring of his cell phone and financial activity has proven ineffective, Tram lives an unconventional lifestyle. He has no fixed address and is not, and it's not unlike him to go uh, extended periods of time without using his phone and bank card. In fact, we found that 
the last time his iPhone registered usage was on April 25th, five days before he started his trip. Additionally, Tram makes his living playing poker and built a sizable bankroll to buy into high stakes events. When he entered the park, he was carrying cash with him. That just adds to his coolness in my yeah. <laughs> yeah not that he does it. Not, not that he does it. That he's good enough. That he's bankrolling high stakes poker. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, one of the one of the comments I I was on um, one of the forums that had some hikers talking about this, and they they recommended to the family that they should uh, call all the casinos in the area and put a you know like give them his information and you should probably give him his picture and they have a program they're like yeah he was here this time and he went this well way, they can this way, this they way. can put like a hold on someone gambling so they can like as soon as he checks in they can prevent him from gambling at the casino which would alert the family that they found him Th- this is yeah. according to someone's comment so oh, okay i don't know anything about that but um before we wrap up the timeline here here's just a few more quotes from the family so Tram has cultivated his this lifestyle where it's really hard to find him, and this is the way that he's lived for the last two and a half to three years, Charlie said. He's very adept at hitchhiking. That's something that hikers like him will do. It's like a skill that they uh, work on, you know, because he had hitchhiked literally hundreds of times. He used to always check in by text or phone like once a week because he knew that I always wanted to hear from him, said his mother, Amy. They believe tram is still out there but not inside the park his family saying it's possible he could have left charlie goes on to say i'm pretty steadfast in my belief that he left the park and he's just going through something for some reason that is keeping him from contacting us he may be going through some kind of life crisis right now and if that's the case maybe that's why he's not calling his mother said while they are still picking up the pieces to what may have happened uh, they really just want to know if he's safe uh, Charlie finally went on the set, just like Tram, like, we love you. We just want you back in our lives. Our lives are so much better when you are in our lives. And I mean, we're, uh, we're just to be great to see you again, Charlie said. So, um, before we get into our theories, I'll just kind of go into kind of the conventional theory that a lot of people are going with is that he became lost and ultimately perished due to dehydration. Um, but the family has countered that Tram is an extremely experienced hiker and outdoorsman, and he was in excellent shape and can cover 20-plus miles per day. Um, while no official statements have been released by the Park Service, the family claims park officials scaled back their search after coming to the conclusion he's no longer in the park. So, I, like I said, I couldn't confirm this but the family is saying that the, the search was scaled back because they don't think he's there. Um, this is probably one of the only cases we'll ever hear of where they scaled back a search and the family's like, yeah, we're good with that. Yeah. Because that's just his personality. Yeah. So, like I said, the family thinks he's alive. According to uh, Charlie, he was too well prepared and too experienced to get lost. Uh, and the parks team conducted an exhaustive uh, search for him. They believe he he left due to unknown circumstances. Um, so they don't know if he decided he wanted to go off the grid or if he was experiencing mental health or substance abuse crisis, or, you know, they think maybe he was a victim of a crime. If he had a ton of cash on him and he was hitchhiking, um, there's always a potential of you hitchhiked with the wrong person. Sure. And they found out you had five grand in your backpack. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's possible. So, um, with all that said, Joe, what is your first kind of gut theory on what happened? Well, first I'll, um, should I read off the, if the people know about this whereabouts, what, if you've heard information about trams whereabouts, Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah read please, that. please call. So if you, if you've seen him, you listen to the show, we got lots of people watch this and listen. If you've seen him call nine zero nine three eight three five six five two or email Find Tramel Evans at gmail.com. That's F I N D T R A M M E L L E V A N S at gmail.com. We'll put it in the show notes too. Yeah. So um, let's see. Honestly, before they even said it, I was thinking to myself, this guy 
kind of gets a kick out of disappearing. Yeah. I'm leaning heavily towards he just decided to split town. Now, could things have happened to him since that happened? Yes. So yeah. I'd say that's up in the air. I think for sure he probably just got out of Dodge because that seemed like his MO. Um, but yeah, I, I was thinking to myself as we were reading this, I was thinking like we probably should have put what episode we were doing on like a week ago. And been like, we're going to be doing this episode on this guy in Milwaukee oh. on this corner. Just yeah. out, like, if he's there, like, he, right. like, he'd be the type of person to be like, show up in the window. Yeah, that would be crazy. That would be, that'd be <laughs> I mean, that would blow our podcast up. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd solve a disappearance. Yes. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm heavily towards that. Okay. Um, tell me yours, then I guess I'll come up with an off the deep end while well, you're talking. I, uh, I'm not discounting his experience, but we've covered a lot of cases where very experienced people have gone missing. So I think just saying someone has done something a, a lot and that they, even that they know the area, I think doesn't mean that they couldn't go lost or Fair. have a medical emergency. I, the thing I keep coming back to just because I've hiked in desert climates, I've run out of water in desert climates on a hike and the fact he only had, um, how much did I say? He had, what, two liters of water with him? Uh, or two gallons of water. He had two gallons of water yeah. with him. Let me just verify that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, he had two gallons of water with him. So we were saying, what did I say? You would need per day, six liters per day. One liter equals 2.6 gallons. So the thing I keep coming back to is I think a good theory, good possibility is that he didn't have enough water with him. He was really exerting himself. Like his family said, he could cover 20 miles in a day. And he got out there deep in Joshua Tree, ran out of water, and got dehydrated, and then just like we we've seen that you just like this it, this could happen to anyone you could be the most experienced hiker climber in the world if you get sure. dehydrated you start making poor decisions sure and something happened to him and he's still in the park and they i mean look at paul miller yep he went missing and they didn't find his remains for years and when they finally found him was not that far from the trail yeah and took, the area has been the, searched it took all the images and yeah in yeah. the area how many times did the area get searched that they found him in yeah many times mm -hmm. so i think a good theory is that he he ran out of water and he's still in the park now i think another very possible theory is i think joe your theory is second on my list i'm just going to occam's razor on that one <laughs> most likely like yeah because i agree with you things can happen but Someone that experienced, it drastically dwindles the possibility of something like that happen. Not impossible. We've yeah. seen it, but that's kind of where it's like the family is pretty confident he left, probably because he's done it a lot of times. He was that experienced. And maybe he only brought two gallons of water because maybe he... <laughs> he didn't do the hike. <laughs> you know, or he was like, I'm just going to crank it out in two days. Yeah. I don't need all this water, and I'll be back at the campsite. Or he just, like, went right to Joshua Tree instead of to where he said he was going to go. Like, because he was, like, right here. Yeah. And he was going to go there. What if he's just like, eh, out of town? Yeah. I don't know. I think his nomadic lifestyle, based on what his family said, I think that's a very strong theory. I mean, the Park Service, according to the family, thinks that's accurate. Yeah. Um, I think a third theory in my book, number three, would be based on his – his history of hitchhiking and that he was a high stakes poker player and had a lot of cash with him. We don't know how much, but I'm assuming someone that's nomadic like that would probably just carry it with them. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't leave it in a bank somewhere if you're going to be bouncing around. Well, bank cards do work everywhere. Yeah. But <laughs> he had a history of not using them. They said okay. he'd like to go off the grid and use cash. Okay. So, I mean, there's a strong possibility he hitchhiked with the wrong person. They found out he had all this cash on him and something, yeah, maybe they. We should email George Land and get his take on it. Yeah, we we could. I think because he he loved talking to us. We should bring him on and see if he'll do an interview on this. We could do yeah. it like the next episode. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I'll maybe put that we'll, as a to do for me. Yeah, reach out to George. Maybe what happened was it was you know he hitchhiked hitchhiked and they found out he had had this cash and they like tried to peacefully 
extract the cash from him, and then a struggle happened, and something happened to him where uh, he was. <laughs> Can then, you please explain how someone peacefully tries to extract cash from somebody? Well, if you have cash and I want it, I'd be like, Joe, give me all your money. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's not peaceful. Well, that's without. I mean, I would be taking your money. It's a verbal violence. threat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not peaceful. Well, you know what I meant. Peaceful is. Can I please have some of that money? <laughs> Okay. Mike, give me all your money. I a, haven't touched you yet. A non-violent extraction of your money. Okay. Uh, we'll call it that. <laughs> Non-physically violent? Yeah, and then it turned violent. Maybe, you know, Tram was like, screw you, I'm not giving you my money. And then, it, yeah. like, a struggle uh, occurred. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. I think my theory is, and they're all, I think one and two are very close. Either dehydration, he's still in the park, or mm-hmm. two, he left the park for some reason. Now... The fact that the family mentioned mental or substance abuse issues, while I have no, there was no evidence that he suffered from any of those prior, but I think just the fact that they mentioned it, maybe, maybe there is some history of that, that I think it's possible. Or they saw him using it. It's just like worried parents. Like, he used drugs. He's got a problem. I mean, if I had but a does friend. Does he have an actual problem or is he just a recreational user, habitual user? So, if I had a friend who went missing and I was listing out what I thought would happen, if that friend didn't have a history of substance abuse, I probably wouldn't. Okay, pose good. That that's as a fair. Theory. That's fair. So, that, that's, that's fair. the only reason why I'm saying that. I'm not saying there was no. No, no, I'm with you on that. I didn't think of it that way. There's no evidence of it, but just because the brother mentioned it makes me think think that maybe something in the past would lead him to say that. Sure. Nope. I, I, I agree with that. I changed because of what you said. <laughs> I've, so, I've truly changed as a result of what you've told me. Uh, those are my theories. I'm I'm still kind of hopeful that he turns up. It's I, I think recent. he's alive. I'll give you my off the deep end. Okay. <laughs> he's in with the mafia. In with some the, sort, so, no, uh, like they're after him for some sort of gambling thing. Oh, kind of like, like he, a, the yeah, movie was, Casino or yes, something. Yes, he was in a high stakes game. He had like an unbeatable hand. And the other person just had he's like an a, even better hand. Like put it all on the line. Maybe he's like a card shark. Yep. And, he, and he, they like, caught him cheating. He started sweating. Like totally like movie. Like got up from his seat. Was like yeah. I, I gotta go take it. Go smoke a cigarette. And he just runs. And now he's on the lamb from the mafia. Okay. That's my off the deep end. And there's gonna be a, and then and he he planned and, the trip in Joshua and but he'll never hear the, went. Yes, he'll hear this story. Yeah. And then he'll come, reach out to us. <laughs> And then he'll do an interview, and we'll do a GoFundMe, and we'll save him by paying off the mafia. We'll have to do, and then we'll do a movie where they it changes your voice, yeah, with kind of the shadow of your face. Tom Cruise will play me in the movie. (laughs) Uh, Matt Damon can play me. No, no, no. 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 I think um, uh, Chelsea Handler will play you. Jack Black. Yeah, Jack Black. (laughs) 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 No, um, Robert Downey Jr. But from Tropic Thunder, will play you. Oh, wow, that's an interesting <laughs> casting choice. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. Yes. Um, no, so I, yeah, my real theory is, I, well, I think it's partially, I'm, a, I'm hopeful that he is okay yeah. and just out wandering around and here's the show and comes on the show. Uh, so I think if the family feels that way, I'm going to agree with them. I'm I think a lot of one. cases we've covered, I've never, very rarely have I actually still, well, it's partly because a lot of cases we cover are old. Yeah, this one's very recent, and he could just turn up somewhere still, like just went off the grid for like a month. I mean, yeah, the search literally winded down, what fifteen days ago? Okay, fifteen, yeah. sixteen so, days yeah. ago. So I mean, we're not very far. I, I hope he's alive. Yeah, uh, for the family, the whole thing, the closure. But it would be awesome if he did an interview with us. And well, and be I, like, hey, how close were we? Were you being chased by the mafia I for think gambling debt? From everything I read, too, the family is just trying to spread the word about the case. So I'm well. This will help. I'm happy that we're able to cover this, and <laughs> we're gonna blow his like like close cover. Method. Yeah, he like wants to be alone, and we're like, here's his picture. Everybody, look. Maybe maybe he's uh, here's an off the deep end. Remember that guy we covered. Um, it, that went missing. I'm using air quotes in Olympic, and he would he was a, like a CIA operative or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe this guy is a government agent. They're gonna start a club of all the people we do episodes on, <laughs> yeah. so and all hang out together and all come out at once. And he, uh, yeah, he, his cover was blown as a high stakes poker player. So now he's got to reinvent himself. Oh, maybe he was an agent. That's uh, why he has a nomadic lifestyle. Yeah, I, I like that. I yeah, like that, I like that. I like that theory a lot. <laughs> so that's my off the deep end. All right. Well, 
That's it. We want to hear your theories. So thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of you for listening and sharing Locations Unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, where you can find all the videos of each episode. Also, if you would like to support the show monetarily, please visit our website and our Facebook store. And where else? Oh, Cool Swag is also on the website. Uh, Additionally, you can subscribe to our Patreon account. Uh, subscribe on YouTube and on Apple subscriptions and soon on Twitter where you will have access to special events and additional shows for paid customers only. Lastly, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time.